All right, well, usually I follow uh, John Fund on Fox off, and so it, uh, here's one, one more I had to go ahead. Th thanks a lot for having both of us here. Um, Morton asked us to talk about the election. And uh, as you know, John, I've written a lot about it. Um, what's kind of interesting is you, you would think our two books, you know, the first book was Who's Counting? How Fraudsters and Bureaucrats Put Your Vote at Risk. And the reason, John, I wrote this going on now five years ago is because uh, we got so tired of hearing the uh, editorial page writers in the New York Times and Washington Post saying, you know, there's just no voter fraud anywhere in the United States. So we basically wrote a book that outlined all these cases across the country of real fraud. And um, if, if you ever get in an argument with your liberal friends about this, I want to tell you about a great resource besides our book, which is uh, about a year and a half ago we decided um, at the Heritage Foundation where I work that we would start a, a database of voter fraud cases from across the country. So we have our interns uh, busily working anytime we run across a story on a voter fraud case. And now these aren't newspaper claims where someone says, well, I think maybe something happened at the polling place. These are cases in which individuals were convicted in a court of law of engaging in voter fraud or a judge ordered a new election in a contest or a race because fraud or other uh, problems like that occurred. And we weren't going, we're, we didn't start going backwards. You know, we're not researching American history for this. We just started as we were running across cases, putting them in. We're, we're up to, um, oh, I think, 450 cases, over 700 individual defendants convicted. And this is from all across the country. So anybody who tells you voter fraud is not a problem in this country uh, is doesn't know what they're talking about. Now, in the last election, uh, we were really lucky. <laughs> and we were really lucky because we have uh, an electoral college system. And what that means, for example, is uh, the enormous amount of fraud that is going on in California because of the fact that we know that there are literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of non-citizens registered in voting in the state uh, did not steal the election from us. Now, that is, there are all kinds of problems across the country. Look, I, I'm not going to tell you there's massive fraud going on everywhere. There's not. But there is fraud going on, and the key to this is something that the U.S. Supreme Court said back in 2008 when it upheld Indiana's photo ID law. It said it could make the difference in a close election. And we have close elections all the time. And one of the biggest problems we have now, besides the kind of absentee ballot fraud that you see in places like Alabama, or the vote buying that you see in places like Kentucky, Kentucky's had uh, at least a dozen cases in the, in the past dozen years of people convicted of buying votes. Um, the other big problem we have right now is that uh, there is absolutely nothing being done in states like Virginia to prevent people who are not U.S. citizens from registering and voting. And if you don't think that's a problem, I will tell you that I know personally it's a problem because for three years, uh, I was a member of the Fairfax County Electoral Board. And we found several hundred individuals who were not U.S. citizens who were on the rolls. And we found it by accident because nobody verifies that you are a U.S. citizen when you fill out your voter registration form. We discovered it only because we started checking DMV records and we found people who had registered to vote in Fairfax County who, when they went to the DMV, said, well, I'm not a U.S. citizen. About half of them had voted in prior elections. Now, we took them off the rolls, uh, and we sent the information to the Commonwealth's attorney for Fairfax County, and we sent it to the United States Justice Department, where I used to work. And you all can imagine what happened to those easy cases. These were a couple hundred of easy voter fraud cases, easy convictions to take because it's a felony under federal law to register and vote if you're a U.S. citizen. 
Nothing was done about those cases. Um, just before this current election, you all may have seen that there was a report released by the Public Interest Legal Foundation. Uh, Public Interest Legal Foundation is this very small uh, uh, conservative um, nonprofit group. Uh, we have a a budget that is a fraction of the size of the NAACP or the ACLU or the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, all these organizations out there who are doing everything they can to ensure that there are no measures in place anywhere that will protect election integrity like voter ID. And um, we started asking counties in Virginia and cities like Alexandria, we would like a list of the individuals who you recently have taken off your voter rolls because they were not U.S. citizens. Um, we got information after a lot of effort from just eight counties. Another 20 counties refused to give us that information, even though they're obligated to under the law. After what happened, the state election board said, "Don't give, don't give them that information." Um, eight counties, and we they they had almost 1,100 individuals not U.S. citizens, who they had taken off the rolls. Now, was any of that information sent to law enforcement? No. And for anyone who thinks that's not a big deal, I would remind you, <clears throat> in the last decade, we've had two attorney general's races decided in this state by less than 1,000 votes. I think in one case, what, 300? 300 votes. And we found 1,100 non-citizens, found them by accident, in just eight counties in Virginia, and we don't know how many are in other counties. How big of a problem is this nationwide? Um, in California, as you know, they provide driver's licenses to people who are, who are non-citizens who are in, the, in this country illegally. Uh, last year, they provided 800,000 driver's licenses to illegal aliens in California. They now have switched to this, this this new measure that progressives are pushing all over the country, automatic voter registration, where they take DMV records. If you have a driver's license, you are automatically registered to vote. Um, so how big of a problem is this nationwide? Uh, two years ago, three professors in Virginia at Old Dominion University and George Mason released a study. And based on congressional survey data, they estimated that in the 2008 election, 6.4% of the non-citizens of the United States voted in the election. Now, 6.4% may not sound like a lot, but uh, they pointed out that would have been enough to uh, win North Carolina for Barack Obama. He only won the state by 14,000 votes, and it would have been enough to win the U.S. Senate race for Al Franken in Minnesota. And if you don't think that was important, you should be reminded that Al Franken was the 60th vote that passed Obamacare. So my point is, is this is a real problem, uh, not just in Virginia, but in a number of other states. And it's something that the new administration is going to have to concentrate on uh, uh, very strongly. And that means they're going to have to have people in the Justice Department who aren't afraid of criticism from the press when they start prosecuting these kinds of voter fraud cases, particularly non-citizens who are registering and voting. And it means that they have to have someone at the Department of Homeland Security who also understands this is a problem. Why? Because I am told that they, the Department of Homeland Security has information in its files about all kinds of non-citizens who have registered and voted. Why? Well, because when you apply for naturalization or when you apply for a change of status, if you're in the country legally as a non-citizen, on the uh, application for naturalization, there, there's a question on there. And the question asks you, have you ever registered or voted in an election? So. There are people, uh, there's all kinds of information in the files there about that, and uh, I will end with this and then I'll let John uh, talk uh, to you about the election too. Um, we, how do we know this is a problem? Um, 
We have in our files a case from Kansas, this happened just uh, two or three years ago, in which in one of the counties, the county election officials thought, you know, it just would be a great idea. We're going to go to the naturalization ceremony that's occurring at the federal courthouse. And as soon as the, these new citizens have uh, sworn the oath and become United States citizens, we're going to offer them the ability to register to vote. We want them to participate in our elections. So they did that, and there they discovered at least a dozen of the new citizens didn't need to register to vote because they were already registered to vote and had voted in prior elections. And again, those are cases where, yeah, they got taken off the voter list, but were any of them prosecuted for it? The answer, of course, is no. Thanks. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be at the breakfast. I've attended these low these many years, and it's a pleasure to actually speak to you from this side of the podium. Morton has done an amazing thing here. I go to a lot of events, including a lot of liberal events. Every year I appear at Netroots Nation. I'm one of the uh, sacrificial panelists they put on uh, to pummel on their um, liberal panels. I guess I'm the official pinata there now. And I go there because I like to see what kind of training their bloggers and their activists get. And I have to tell you the good news. Identity politics really makes it difficult to have effective political training. Because half the time you're worrying about who's next to you and whether they should be there, whether they should be in the Pacific Islander Caucus or whether they should be in the LGBT Caucus. And the other half of the time you're worrying about making any kind of rhetorical slip. Morton's programs have, I think, changed the country. They certainly have changed the movement and invigorated it. And I, for one, do not believe we would have anything like the upcoming generation of young leadership without Morton Schools. And long may they let it rain. Now here's why they're going to be more needed than ever. Of course, we were all pleasantly surprised at the election result. And we should shiver under our sheets at how close we came to disaster. A little bit more fraud in a couple of states, a few missteps not made in terms of voter turnout, a couple of appearances in a state you should have shown up in several times and didn't show up at all, Wisconsin, the election would have been different. The Democrats for years have said demography is destiny and they meant it. If you can't win an election with the population you have, you're going to have a new population that will elect you. And that is part of their strategy. I'm here to tell you reluctantly, because I think it's a, an important issue and I think it needs to be resolved, but the whole immigration debate is not what you think it is. Frankly, it is a debate about whether or not a whole bunch of people can come here and the distinction between citizenship and non-citizenship can be completely blurred or eradicated and a whole bunch of people get to vote and to shift the existing electoral patterns. That's what it's all about. That's what the whole immigration debate is politically. Now there are cultural, economic, educational, socioeconomic considerations, but that's not what's really being debated in Congress when the Democrats led by Chuck Schumer put forward their path to citizenship proposals. They have pretty much concluded that path to citizenship is a hard sell for the American people. So rather than try to get these people to become citizens, they're going to just try to blur and obliterate the distinction between citizenship and non-citizenship. And there are no limits to this. I, for my sins, grew up in San Francisco. I've never lived in a zip code where anyone ever agreed with me, I can assure you. By the way, San Francisco, Manhattan, and the District of Columbia all share one thing in common. I've lived in all three places, and all three places gave Donald Trump precisely 8% of the vote. <laughs> In San Francisco, my hometown, they had a ballot measure last November. Two ballot measures. Both were opposed, actually, by many liberals and many liberal groups, including the local paper, the San Francisco Comical. I'm sorry, Chronicle. The first was 
16 year olds should vote in every local election. 16 year olds. And that's just a start to getting down to 14 and 12 and who knows where after that. It narrowly lost. The other was to elect to allow any non-citizen, there was some technical language that they might have to be here with some papers, although who would check them is a separate issue, any non-citizen should be allowed to vote in local elections. That passed! Joining Silver Spring, Maryland, up the road, and, and a few other places like Tacoma Park that allow this to happen in local elections. Bill de Blasio, mark my words, if he thinks his, he's in danger for a second term in November of this year, he will have his city council pass a law allowing everyone with naturalization papers or a green card to vote in the city of New York elections. You can't do this for federal elections. That requires still an act of Congress until they take power again. But that's, that would be the goal if he's in danger of losing a second term. The problem that we have here is if we lose this battle, we lose everything. Because once you've obliterated the distinction between citizenship and non-citizenship, where do you go? How do you monitor? How do you process? How do you regulate any election whatsoever? Or is it just who shows up? There's a fundamental difference in the world view of people on the left and people on the right. I think its best articulation was made by Thomas Sowell, who sadly just announced he's retiring from column writing this month. He wrote a wonderful book, which I recommend to you, called The Conflict of Visions in which he said, the liberal view is an unconstrained view of human nature. Democracy is defined by how many people participate in it, not the quality of the debate or the outcomes that result from it. So more democracy, more people voting is good per se. And anything that questions whether or not everybody should be voting, and everybody should be voting without any regulations, is an irritant or an obstacle to democracy. It's an unconstrained view. So they have this carried through in every other issue. Conservatives are more bound by the rule of law. I just hope that also goes for our current president, come to be. Uh, the cons conservatives are bound by the rule of law, constraints on arbitrary power, constraints and rules that regulate and have procedures by which we conduct our democracy, run our republic, honor our constitution. What we see over and over again in the cases that Hans and I have written about and will be writing about in our next book, we see over and over again the desire that rules are an irritant and they must be dispensed with and anyone who stands in their way is racist and xenophobic and opposed to the popular will. Unless it's the last election, <laughs> which was a temporary aberration on the march of history. We have to fight this. And Hans hinted at what needs to be done. I will nail it down even more concretely. If the Trump administration fails to address this issue in a clear, responsible, fact-based way, in a tweet at 3 a.m. in the morning saying there were more illegal votes than I lost the popular vote by does not count for that. That hard hurts the debate. It doesn't help the debate to make such statements without substantiation. If the Trump administration does not move on those measures, it is signing its death sentence for its re-election. Because if prosecutors will not prosecute these cases, if election officials will not send them the evidence, as Hans indicates, of these cases, if prosecutors who do get the evidence decide, there's a whole lot of political flack here. I want to run for Congress someday. I don't want to have people accusing me of racism by prosecuting voter fraudsters. If any single one of them are people of color, I'm doomed. If we don't have people of courage to take this on at the local, at the state level, and at the federal level, I can guarantee you they will march through this as if, as if it were an open door. The federal government is limited, as it should be, because the primary responsibility for elections belongs to the state and local levels. But the federal government has been so inert and so inactive in this area, there's a lot it can do very quickly. And it's, be, it's, it's really incumbent upon all of you to get involved as citizens because you know people 
whether it's your representatives in Congress or people in the movement, who can reach the ears of those in power and urge them that this has to be a top priority. It's not just housekeeping, it's not just boring election law, this is their re-election. First thing, the Obama administration, one of the first things it did when it took over the Justice Department was decide that there would be no more cases filed under the Help America Vote Act, which said, if you take federal money to improve your election mechanisms, your systems, your voting machines, you have a responsibility to keep your voting rolls accurate and up to date. Many places haven't. There are hundreds of jurisdictions where there are more voters on the rolls than there are citizens over the age of 18, according to the Census Bureau. We call that a clue for potential fraud. <laughs> Obama administration dropped a case they were going to win in Missouri, and one of their, Julie Rodriguez, one of their assistant attorney generals, told a group of 30 lawyers, we are no longer prosecuting cases in this area because we are all about increasing voter turnout, never decreasing voter turnout. Forget whether the voter turnout is legal or not, that's a separate issue. Those cases have to be brought back and reinforced. The kind of cases now that are being brought privately by the group that Hans mentioned, the Center for Public Interest. Secondly, the Obama administration has fought tooth and nail the four or five states that have now said you should have proof of citizenship before you get to register to vote. They have fought them bitterly, tooth and nail, to the extent that when the Election Assistance Commission tried to take the side of these states, they refused to defend their own federal agency's position in court and tried to undermine it by siding with the left-wing groups that were trying to overturn it. Hans can answer that in the Q&A session. It's an extraordinary development. And lastly, we have, we have been sitting on records which can clean up our voter rolls very quickly and might lead to some prosecutions. But for eight years, the Obama administration's Department of Homeland and Security has refused to give states the list of legal, legal aliens who are in this country that the states could then take and compare with their voter rolls. And the only excuse they have is gobbledygook about privacy considerations. I'm sorry, this is another branch of government trying to improve its voter rolls. They have a right to federal records which can help them do that because these records are part of federal elections. And lastly, the IRS is sitting on a whole bunch of tax records because an awful lot of people are in this country, shall we say, without proper documentation. That nonetheless, often use their own name and often use their own social security number. They don't often, they, sometimes they don't borrow a social security number from someone else, and sometimes they don't borrow a name from someone else. They often use their own name and their own social security number. Those records could be used by states to compare with voter registration records, and we could soon find a whole bunch of people who are here illegally and also on the rolls and probably even voting. We can discuss their legal status at another point. But the point is, we have the tools if the Trump administration and the Trump Justice Department under Jeff Sessions want to use them. If we do not use those tools, we deserve everything that is coming towards us and everything they will do towards us in 2020. Thank you.